All right, welcome everybody to the August edition of the Key Ministry Disability Ministry Video Roundtable. My name is Beth from Key Ministry and we're doing something a little different today. Um, we always have a topic on the third Wednesday, but we brought an expert. If you're talking theology and disability ministry, Steph Hubach is who you want to be talking to. So um, I'm just really excited that she's here with us today to lead us through this discussion. This is something um, she did address during the Disability in the Church conference that happened in Orlando this last spring. Um, and it's just like, there's so much more we need to talk about. And so she is bringing it to our audience today. So without any further ado, Steph, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce yeah. yourself and just okay. start leading us in this topic. So thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna disclaim the expert status, <laughs> but thank you for your kindness. <laughs> So uh, let's see, the, what I'd like to do is just open us in prayer because I do think this can be a turbulent topic for those of us who were making um, airline jokes earlier before we started recording. So let's just do that real quickly. Uh, so Heavenly Father, just thank you, Lord, for, we thank you for your word, God, that gives us um, all that we need for faith and life. And I just pray that you would give us uh, wisdom and uh, respectful conversation as we navigate our way through the challenges of how to um, to respect disability culture and, and at the same time uh, adhere to kingdom values. And I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us wisdom and uh, give us grace in our conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. So, yeah, so this is part of it. This, what I did is I took a part of a presentation I had done at uh, Disability in the Church and realized it was too long, right? So, <laughs> which is anybody who's sat through my presentations before knows that that is, is my, uh, one of my great weaknesses is trying to cram too much material. And so I'm going to, I tried this time to narrow this down a little bit more to just simply this issue of this idea of oil and water, right? How do we re respond when the values of disability culture don't mix with kingdom values? Um, and what I wanna say as a uh, sort of a caveat to that first is that I'm not in any way saying that all disability culture values conflict with all kingdom values. I am not saying that. There are many, many places where we have a wonderful overlap in terms of the uh, many of the action items that we and the things we care about, right? Um, that said, the basis from which even those values spring is not is not always the same root, right? And so, what I really want to do is to say, let you know, yeah, there are lots of places we already have commonality. Wonderful, right? There are other places where we have commonality, but it comes from different sources, right? And there are other places we don't have commonality. Okay, and so that's the that's my. That's my big, big picture there for you. Um, let's see, let's go. How come this is not advancing? Because, there we go. Let's go there. Uh -huh. All right, so where we're gonna head today is, uh, what I'll probably do is, is um, hang with me. I wanna present to you for about a half an hour and then we'll talk for about a half an hour. Okay, so, and the reason I wanna present first is I just want you to hear me all the way through, right? Um, I don't want to get bogged down in arguments along the way, right? That may derail us from actually getting to where we want to go. So let's just look at what I have to say here. And then I'd be glad to discuss with you and amongst each other, right? Uh, what you uh, can agree with and what maybe you don't and, and why. So um, I'll do a quick introduction of who I am. Um, and uh, then I always, my background's actually originally in economics. I always like to define my terms. I think it helps a lot, and especially in where we come from different theological backgrounds. When I use these words, these, this is what I mean, right? So uh, then we'll talk about uh, kingdom values from Luke 4. Uh, we could get kingdom values from many different places in the New Testament. I chose to use Luke 4 because that was Jesus' inaugural speech of his uh, coming of his kingdom, right, in the synagogue. And so that is one place, starting place. For me, that's the starting place I chose today. We'll talk about disability culture values in general, but what we'll do is derive them from uh, the neurodiversity paradigm, right? And so we'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about why does this matter, right? So um, let's see if we can zoom through 
dad. This is my my crew. So this is my husband, Fred, and my youngest son, Tim, who has Down syndrome. And uh, he lives at home with us in his own apartment. Uh, and uh, is the uh, was the cart guy for many years at the local grocery store where his uh, mantra was customer service for the glory of God. <laughs> so he's a great work ethic. He, that grocery store burned down, unfortunately, and God provided him with a new job and a new store, and he is equally loved there. So we're very thankful for that. And my husband's a retired engineer from Case New Holland. Uh, so he's the one who's able to fix stuff around the house, thank goodness, because that's not my gift. <laughs> So I, I work uh, for Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis uh, as a research fellow in disability ministries, which at this stage of my life largely means that I uh, do writing, speaking, mentoring on disability ministry related uh, topics, and then also uh, influence uh, faculty and students on the whole area of disability ministry, trying to uh, help to create that in a, um, a biblically sound way. Here's my one of my favorite little, you know, all Presbyterians seem to use Lord in the Rings analogies. And here's my favorite one from from Gimli the Dwarf in The Return of the King. He's he he's ready to go into battle, saying, "Certainty of uh, of uh, death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for?" Right? That's my mantra for for disability ministry, <laughs> and sometimes also for just really trying to engage engage culture, right? And constructively so that's what we're going to attempt to do <laughs> certainty of death small chance of success but what are we waiting for so um so why does this topic matter um there's a great quote by harvey Kahn. if you've never read this old book called evangelism doing justice and preaching grace i highly commend it to you he says the keys to the kingdom are not locked in a drawer they are given to the church and this is his uh source for that of course is matthew 16 18 to 19 where jesus gives the keys to peter right who he says will be the rock upon which you'll build his church and lad goes on to say they're given to the church um the church has been placed on earth to proclaim the kingdom and to exemplify it so to proclaim the kingdom of god and to exemplify it um and so that means that we have a huge responsibility as the church right to actually steward the king keys of the kingdom well we're meant to proclaim the the kingdom by preaching the gospel right we're meant to exemplify it by uh, demonstrating what a, the countercultural community of believers is to look like right um, and so my question to you is how are we stewarding the keys of the kingdom what i want to use is my source as i said earlier was luke 4 uh, 16 to 21 so let's just read this through uh, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. The next verse. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, we're not gonna do that one. So what we're going to do too, first is, I had the wrong slide in there, sorry guys. What we're gonna do first is define terms. That's where we are. So an introduction and define terms. So first I want to talk about what is the kingdom. And this will all sound very uh, static to you all <laughs> at first, but it's important for us as we're discussing it. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is simply, it's the reign of God, right? It's a, it's a, his reign, not a domain, right? That's the way to think about it. It's not a place. It is the power of God it is, or the, the sway of God's power, right? not a place right so the so the reign of god is good news right this the kingdom is good news and an overarching story of a world that was created good but is fallen and it experiences degrees of brokenness in every dimension of life right so that's the idea of the kingdom it's this reign of god and it's good news uh in an overarching story of a world that created good but has fallen and experiences degrees of brokenness in every dimension of life. So what's the gospel then, 
right? Gospel is the good news of the coming of the kingdom. Gospel means good news. It's the pushing back of the effects of the fall in every area of life, bringing flourishing in its place. So it's centrally, this begins centrally um, with Christ's saving reign in us, right? Christ's saving reign in us that's made possible through faith in the finished work, work of Christ's perfect life lived on our behalf, sacrificial death lived, died on our behalf, being raised in victorious resurrection power on our behalf. And then that flows into our relationships with self, others, and nature. Okay. So, so it's centrally about this saving reign, this reign of God within us, right? It has ramifications as that flows through us, right? And it's that good news of the, of the coming of Christ's kingdom, which is about his reign, his saving reign in our hearts. Right? And the church, this is this distinction between the kingdom and the church that gets mixed up sometimes. The kingdom creates the church. It works through the church and is bro it proclaimed to the world by the church, but they remain two distinguished concepts, right? The rule of God is the kingdom, right? The sway of God, the power of God. And the church is the fellowship of men and women who have saving faith in Christ, right? So that's the idea. So that's, the, that's why I wanted to lay out the kingdom, the gospel, the church. These things are essential to the rest of my presentation, though. Another thought about the church before we move on is that this means that while the church in this age uh, never attains perfection, Right, and that's an important thing to remember in disability ministry. We're always going to miss the mark, right? We're never going to get to 100% perfection on on how we do any form of ministry, in, in, including this one. Uh, it must, nevertheless, right, aim for the life of the perfect order, the eschatological kingdom of God, right? So it's this idea that. Um, that we still have to aim for this life of the perfect order. Because remember, the church's role is to proclaim the gospel, the good news of the coming of the kingdom, which is the power of God to reverse all the effects of the fall, right? Starting centrally with the good news, the reign of Christ in us, right? Flowing out through us. Um, and to uh, so it's to proclaim that and to exemplify it, right? To, to attempt to live the life of the perfect order, right? the eschatological kingdom of God, meaning what the kingdom of God will look like in all its perfection someday. Okay. Um, so when I think about disability ministry, here's how I like to define it. Um, making the gospel, the good news of the coming of Christ's kingdom, accessible to all in word and deed, right? Making the gospel, the good news of the coming of Christ's kingdom, accessible to all in word and deed. And what I love about that definition is it doesn't even have disability in it, right? Because when we make the gospel, when we, those who are, uh, 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 when we make the gospel accessible to people with disabilities, it becomes more accessible also to those who do not have disabilities, right? Because it it simply takes the gospel and makes it more full and more real, right? In its in its applications to our lives. So so it's not a one way street that the quote unquote able bodied right make the gospel accessible to people with disabilities. Um, people with disabilities who know Jesus make the gospel amazingly accessible, right? More accessible to other believers and to people with typical abilities right who are outside of christ so making the gospel the good news of the coming of the kingdom accessible to all in word and deed and another way i like to think about that is so that the um so that the deaf might hear it the blind might see it people with dis with intellectual disabilities might understand it people with neurological um impairments right might be able to process it People with physical disabilities can hear the preaching of God's word and that everybody experiences the loving hands and feet of Jesus, right? In the in the body of Christ, exemplifying, right? This idea of the kingdom to the world. So let's look at the kingdom values from Luke 4. I already read the passage, right? And what I wanna tell you from Luke 4 that I think are, are core kingdom values that come out of Jesus' proclamation of his ministry are, and then I'll demonstrate these in a second. Because I thought it was important to lay out. Here's what I believe the kingdom values are. 
here's what we're hearing sometimes in some places in disability culture that mix like oil and water, right? And here's where we go with that. Okay, so here's what the values are. Truth, humility, grace, mercy, and justice. Okay, truth, humility, grace, mercy, and justice. So where did I get those? All right, like I told you, I had a background in economics. I descend into charts sometimes. So Alan, bear with me. I'll do my best to explain this chart here, okay? <laughs> so what I've got across the top, the head headers are Jesus gospel. What is it, right? The experience of the hearers to whom it is expressed, right? That's the second column. The spiritual nature of that gospel. That's the third column. Fourth column is the material nature of that gospel in its functional aspects, right? That, let me count. Fifth column is material nature of that with its social aspects, right? And then let's see, I've got to get my paper because I can't see my screen right now. The kingdom value that comes out of that, okay? So, so the first one, Jesus gospel proclaims good news to those who experience, second column, poverty, right? The poor. Proclaim good news to the poor. What does that mean spiritually? Those who are bankrupt before God and know it, right? That's what spiritual poverty is, the spiritual dimension of Jesus' proclamation here. What's the material dimension of that? It's those without essential material resources and they know it, right? That's, that's material poverty. And then the social dimension is I, I have on here, see oppressed. We'll talk about oppression at the end when Jesus talks about oppression, but there's an oppression or a social dimension as well. So proclaiming good news to the poor, those who are bankrupt before God and know it materially, those who are without essential material resources and know it, and those who experience a, a social form of oppression. And the, the kingdom value that comes out of that is it requires a posture of humility so I have humility in red, right? That receives grace in red and responds to others with mercy in red, right? That's what comes out of that sentence there. The next line is recovery of sight for the, and the experience blind, right? Recovery of sight for the blind. Spiritually, that means those who are unable to find their way to God and know it, right? Materially, those without the essent an essential bodily resource and know it, it's in this case, the essential body bodily resource provision. And I'm not, not implying by that that someone cannot live without their vision. I'm saying it's, it's considered an essential resource for which you can make accommodations, right? And then that there is, is a, a form of oppression, a material or social aspect of that. And we can see that easily if we had time to go into John 9, right? And <laughs> what happens with the crowd, the disciples, the Pharisees, the whole shooting match, right? And again, the outcome of the kingdom value there we can see is a posture, requires a posture of humility to admit that spiritually we're unable to find our way to God and we know it. It's a posture of humility to admit we're without an essential bodily resource when there's a material functional aspect here um and the, again the response is to be mercy right mercy i like the my definition that i like the best of mercy is that belongs to saint gregory of nyssa which is mercy is a voluntary sorrow which enjoins itself to the suffering of another right and we could unpack that for a day but that was there. next one down proclaim freedom for the prisoner right which spiritually means those who are in bondage to sin and know it, right? Materially, in a functional and practical sense, means that someone who has no escape from a situation and knows it, right? And that there can be forms of a material and social oppression associated with being a prisoner as well. And so that, again, we'll refer to when we get to oppression. Same pattern again, posture of humility that required, that, that acknowledges bondage to sin spiritually, acknowledges that one has no escape from a situation functionally, right? Um, and the response is to be mercy. And then the last one that Jesus refers to is to set free the oppressed, right? So that's the final row here, set free the oppressed. And spiritually means those who are oppressed by sin and know it. Right? Sin has oppressive power in our lives. 
And we're going to skip over here then to the column on material, uh, the material application there. And this is where the social dimension comes in, held down by the use of power that is immoral or inequitable. That is the concept of social oppression, right? And as you can see, so, so Alan, if you could see the chart, you would see that next to each of the statements on poverty, blindness, prisoner, I'd have not only the spiritual and the functional, but also the idea of oppression would apply here to each one, right? It's there's the potential to be held down by the use of power that is immoral or inequitable in each one of those situations, right? And so what's our what's the what Jesus asking of us in this last one? It's a posture of humility to in the spiritual context for each of us to recognize that we are oppressed by sin and, and know it, right? It's also that the necessity to re recognize that um, uh, uh, the oppressed are are held down by uses of power by other human beings, right? That is immoral or inequitable, and the response is to be justice, right? <laughs> so you see these values. Then uh, and this is why I want to go back to. We can come back to this chart during discussion later. So don't don't. Uh, to bend out of shape if something here doesn't suit. Uh, the overarching thing is that Jesus is speaking from a posture of truth about the truths that are true of us, right? All of us spiritually and certain groups of people, both materially, functionally and socially, functionally and socially, okay? And to every one of us in any combination of those categories, all of us fall under the spiritual, right? That the response is to be one of humility, of owning our poverty, right? Our blindness, our, um, um, sorry, I missed my next one. Sorry, our, our, our imprisonment, right? And depression, spiritually. And to be responsible to our neighbor who is struggling with, a functional or social material manifestation right of all of those same things so out of that then comes a response of grace right that we're to we're to move in grace towards other each other as god has moved in grace towards us by demonstrating mercy where there's a functional uh issue that needs to to be addressed and justice where there is um oppression that needs to be addressed okay so, could, so you can see there's a lot of stuff in there right <laughs> but i i think you can make a pretty decent case here that these values are pretty uh clearly derived out of jesus talk here truth humility grace mercy justice and again, my economics background comes in where I get to say, okay, let's assume I'm right. <laughs> assumptions, <laughs> make some assumptions that we're going to move forward. So let's talk about some disability culture values. Now, remember, again, what I said at the beginning is I'm not saying that all kingdom values are in opposition with disability culture values. There are many places where we have overlap. And there are some places we have overlap coming from different roots and other places where we do not have overlap. Okay. So for the necessity of doing this conversation, I have to speak to the negative, right? But you got to understand, I also assume there's a lot of positive, right? So what I'm going to use to speak to the negative, and this, this is not, an, and I'm not a black and white R, not, there's no value in this. What I'm saying is this, is this is the neurodiversity paradigm, which is different than just talking about neurodiversity in general, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, is, is a uh, promoted by a disability advocate called Nick Walker, right? And um, the paradigm just gives us an example, right? A very, to me, a very clear example of play, a place where disability values are rooted in very different roots and actually the values themselves are very different than kingdom values, okay? So this is to me a, one of a very ho helpful example because it's very, uh, clear what the contrast is so um 
again, this is not a knock on the idea of neurodiversity itself. The term neurodiversity means that across a spectrum of diversity in human beings, our individual brains can function in very different ways for a wide variety of reasons. That's the, that's the essential idea of what neurodiversity means, right? Um, so in other words, from a broad Christian perspective, we can agree that uh, God has designed individual human beings with a wide array of different neurological capacities, right? So uh, that's true. You can come to um, Psalm 139, 13 to 4, you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. Here we were, we talked about what neurodiversity is. Okay, neurodiversity paradigm is, um, it's again, Nick Walker's material and it, and it moves from a general state, this general statement I just made about neurodiversity and here, just, I'll say what that was again, right? Uh, that, that the term neurodiversity means that across the spectrum of diversity in human beings, our individual brains can function in very different ways for a wide variety of reasons. That's what neurodiversity, that's how I'm using that term. I have no problem with that term. Um, what they do have a problem with is uh, Nick goes from that to claiming core principles of the neurodiversity paradigm, right? Which is is from which he operates, right? And uh, and there are these three principles: no expression of human. And you can look this up online. Uh, I'll give you the links. <laughs> no expression of human diversity can be named right or wrong. Right. Number two, classifying neurodivergence as disability is scientifically invalid and socially oppressive. Number three, the social dynamics around neurodiversity are similar to other other minority groups, including unequal distribution of social power. And um, what I would say here is that the key here is the terminology, right or wrong, in the first point. No expression of human diversity can be right or wrong. That is, there's an element of the, what, that that's true, right? That no person can be said to be designed by God as right or wrong, right? But the implication of this is not that, right? The implication of this statement is that there is no functional component to disability. Remember, we talked earlier in the Luke 4 passage about, about that there's a spiritual element to what Jesus is talking about, and then there's the functional material and the functional, and then the social material aspect, right? This implication is that there is no functional component to disability. And I would argue that there is both a functional impairment, impairment, right? The part of the body that doesn't work the way we expect it to, right? And the social impairment, right? Which is the part of the body, I mean, the, the ways in which we treat people that impair much further than the, than the condition itself. Right. So, and even the ADA actually lays out disability that way. Go out and read the legal language. It's a three-part definition and it lays out, lays out both the functional impairment and the social dimension. And I would say that that is a very biblical view to, to include both of those things. And so uh, the key here is the terminology that it implies there is no functional component to disability. On uh, number two in this statement, the functional disability is an imposed category not an experienced reality, right? So when it says classify neurodivergence as disability is scientifically invalid and socially impressive, oppressive. So it's the idea here is that it's the functional aspect is only an imposed category, not an experienced reality. Um, uh, and only uh, the only disability is the social disability. Uh, there's only difference and there's not difficulty, right? That's the implication of, of number two. Um, and I would ask you how many people with autism, ADHD, sensory processing disorder, et cetera, do you know who would disagree with this? Is their experience difficulty free, right, outside of the social dimension? Um, and number three, again, the focus of this point is on the social dimension of disability in terms of power structures, that if the world functioned with equal power structures, disability in practice would disappear, right? That's the underlying, so these are the underlying key components of the neurodiversity paradigm. And what I want to tease out of those is what are the three values that you can can see are in there. Before I do that, I want to ask you this, which is I think what's always helpful when we're looking at any uh, any situation where we have a different perspective 
right, is to say, what can we affirm in this view, right? And I think I tried to affirm certain things in each one of it, uh, each one of those points. What can we not affirm in this view, right? And how do we bring the gospel to bear, right? So we need to always be asking ourselves those things. So what, what can we affirm? We can affirm, right, that the statements that Nick Walker makes in the neurodiversity paradigm really do reflect real human longings, right? The longing to be needed, the longing to be valued, the longing to be recognized, the longing to be affirmed, um, and that there is a social dimension of disability that is real and does exist, right? And it does cause real damage to people and, and to the quality of people's lives. I think we can affirm those things. <clears throat> what we can't affirm, biblically speaking, is that it's based on a naturalistic worldview, right? As if all of all of the world, we can't affirm its foundations, right? Um, it, if it, it has a naturalistic worldview that all that there is is what we can see and what we can see can be fixed, right? That's essentially a, a, a naturalistic worldview. So there is no creator, right? Um, he makes no claims on us. He shows no concerns for us because he doesn't exist. Therefore, this is not his world, nor are, nor are we his, right? So that's the, that's the underlying worldview behind this <clears throat> framework of thinking. Um, the other thing we cannot affirm is it denies, as I said earlier, the existence of functional impairment that does cause difficulty. Um, it, that experience is real for many and the understanding of its roots are available to us in scripture, the functional aspect of disability. Number oh. three number three is that uh, we cannot affirm that in the neurodiversity paradigm, since nothing is broken, there's nothing to be ultimately restored, right? There's, so so um, there's no category for the restoration of brokenness in both either the functional or the social categories of disability, which is the whole idea of the coming of the kingdom, the restoration of brokenness, right? Um, and the values, and this is what I want to focus on next, is this, this idea of identity, control, and power, are the underlying values here. So identity being um, one of the foundational questions of identity is really the idea, who names you, right? Um, in, in other words, do we define our own identities or is our identity centrally given to us? Right. And so in disability culture and in the secular culture in general, identity is self-determined. Right. And there are a lot of understandable reasons why people go that route, because when when human beings name other human beings, it often doesn't end well, does it? <laughs> right. And I think that's part of what this viewpoint is kind of driving at. But from a Christian standpoint, we don't we don't um, identify ourselves in a self-determined way. It's not I say who I am. It's not who I am who I say I am. It's I am who you say I am. <laughs> Capital Y, as in God himself, right? And in this self-naming of the formation of identity uh, for in the disability culture, disability is central to identity, right? Uh, and, and so it can be inherently a barrier to the gospel for if we know... Uh, if we are to know Jesus personally and experience his saving reign, right, of his kingship in our lives, we need to accept his definition of who we are and whose we are. That's the central starting point for embracing the gospel in humility, right, and coming to Christ is, is that our identity is, is defined for us by God himself. And I could have a whole other presentation I could do for you on identity. Okay? <laughs> but, but that's, this is where we are in this one for right now. Okay, so this is a value that in disability culture comes from different roots and then produces different fruit. Okay, I would, I would say that that is the case. Same thing with control. And again, this is understandable. People who have struggled with feeling socially oppressed by other people are naturally, from a human standpoint, going to want to respond back with power and control, right? That is just, and that's, those are the next two we're going to look at, it's, it's control and power, right? And so um, this issue of control being um, used through, largely through language in this case, right? It, you reconstruct reality by changing 
the language. Um, now that can be a positive thing, right? It can be positive to change language to more accurately reflect truth. Remember one of the kingdom values is truth, right? But it can also, language can also, and we all know this, can be used in a controlling and manipulative way, right? And so trying to discern carefully when is language being used to be genuinely truthful and to be consistent with how scripture teaches us to view the world and when is it being to be being used to be controlling or manipulative um, so language can be used in ways that d demean or stigmatizing God never intends us to use language that way that kind of language ought to always be corrected to what is truthful right um, uh, but language can also be used in ways that dodge and weave the truth right and so um, and, I, and the truth of the matter biblically is that disability is a, a normal part of life in an ab normal world where the world itself is not as it was originally intended to be and none of us should be surprised right when we run into either functional dimensions of disability or the social aspects of it so the value of control particularly when truth is compromised right is a huge barrier to the gospel in the local church because jesus is the way the truth and the life and his followers need to be people of truth as well, right? So we cannot experience the liberating true good news about the gospel unless we're willing to hear the true bad news about ourselves, right? And so that's where the issue of control um, comes in. As image bearers, we all have agency, and that comes straight out of Genesis 1. We all are created with agency over ourselves and in the world around us and in relationship to others. That's absolutely true. But we do not have ultimate control. Right? We ought not to be trying to exercise ultimate control over other people in order to advance our own aims. And I'm going to do, and I realize, Beth, this could end up being a follow-up discussion, but <laughs> down all of this, but I want to do the, the power, which is closely aligned with control, right? <laughs> I, I think of the value of power as being more related to rights and position, right? And to active directional influence, right? So every human being, like I said, is endowed with dignity as an image bearer of the living God, and as such ought to be treated with honor and with respect, absolutely. A disability does not increase or decrease this requirement. Doesn't It's the same level playing field for every single person. Um, that said, the Church of Jesus Christ is not to be a place where we fight for our rights. Uh, in Philippians 2, Paul tells us how Jesus laid down his rights. Right? He laid down his rights, his right to equality with God in order to take on human form and acquire our salvation. My point here is not that there are never issues of justice to be engaged. What I'm saying is the church is not a place to fight power with power, okay? And that is can be a cultural value that can get imported into the church. It's not a place for revolution. It, the church is a place for reformation. It's not a place for revolution. It's a place for reformation. A misplaced emphasis on acquiring power in order to exercise control so that one might name one's own identity is not a spirit-led dynamic, right? And it will result in being an authentic barrier, a barrier to the authentic gospel in our lives and its values, okay? So I know those are some hard sayings, but I want you to look at it here and you can read, I have a whole chapter on this in Same Lake, Different Boat. Um, this is the idea of revolution versus reformation in the church and the scriptural basis, and I don't have time to read this today, is out of Romans 12. If you go and read Romans 12, I think you'll be able to see where these come from, right? But the idea of revolution is energized by frustration. And I'm not saying the frustration isn't real. I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> frustration is real. And so the temptation to operate out of frustration is real, right? But a, a revolutionary mindset, right, will promote, promote forcible change uh, on the outside, right? It's it's a it's that that's why the power and the control is so important. It's forcible outside change, and the attainment of the cause is more important than individual relationships or people in the process, right? And it focuses by getting there by the acquisition of power, right? Reformation is energized by God's mercy towards us. So a transforming work of Christ in my life, right? With me recognizing all the things that Jesus says about me spiritually in Luke 4, right, is what ought to motivate me because of his mercy, his voluntary sorrow that enjoined itself to my suffering, right? Um, 
that promotes me to to uh, engage in spirit led change that starts from the inside, right? It's not forcible change coming from the outside. It's spirit led change that starts from the inside, and it values all people, right? While retaining a sense of perspective, right? All people while retaining a, a, a sense of perspective, and it also um, is focused on the expression of love, right? And so. It's, can you see how different those two engines of change are? It's so easy to go ref revolution because it feels better. <laughs> it, it feels like it will be faster, right? But, but I would argue that reformation is the spirit's way to bring about change within the body of Christ, right? And so, and by operating out of kingdom values, and if we go back to those again, being, what were they? They were truth. Right, they were. Where's my slides? I don't have all these memorized off the top of my head at the moment. Where's my heart? Sorry, I don't have that slide in there, guys. There we go. Truth, the heart one is humility, grace, mercy. mercy, and justice. Okay, not identity, control, and power. Okay, so. Why does this matter? And then we will go to what we have left in discussion, which Beth, can we go over five minutes or something? Question being here, how do I bring the gospel to bear here? So what we wanna do is say, what can I affirm? What can I not affirm? How do I bring the gospel to bear? Let's see. And why does this matter? It matters because the church has been given the keys to the kingdom, right? To proclaim the gospel of the kingdom and to exemplify the life of the kingdom. And those kingdom values include truth, humility, grace, mercy, and justice. The values of dis disability culture are not always in opposition to those by any means, but sometimes they are when they are the values of identity, control, and power. So bringing in distorted values from disability culture can distort the gospel message itself, creating barriers to embracing the gospel. Biblically based identity, remembering who, and this is the ultimate truth teller, who with the capital W, right, is actually in control of all things, where true power lies in the gospel is essential, right? So, um, that's what I have to offer. And I'm sorry that we had so much technology, <laughs> so many technology issues that made it difficult to uh, talk, but I will leave my screen up in case somebody wants me to go back to a slide. Uh, actually, um, if you could stop sharing, just because it'll yeah. be easier sure. to yep. see everybody and have the discussion. Yeah, that's um, fine. Yep. Although the slides are great. So just in case people didn't see yeah. in the chat, we will post we'll make the slides available mm -hmm. to everybody. So, um, yay. Right. All right. Um, so I had pretty much muted everybody. So okay. whether you want to or not. Um, so please unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question, make a comment. Um, and I know we're, we're approaching our hour. So I know some of you will have to drop off, but um, we can have this discussion as long as you want to stay. Would anybody like to share? I really love that um, <clears throat> concept of not revolution, but uh, reformation. And it's just, I think there's so many things that are, it's really sneaky, um, a really tricky thing to determine between where that spirit is coming from sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's like, is it is this really reformation or is this revolution? Mm -hmm. That's why I always going back to, to being people of prayer, right? So the spirit helps us discern what are the true motives of our hearts, right? And and we can and ministry leaders can be just as as, as misled by our own motives, at, not only by picking up cultural values that don't necessarily coalesce with kingdom values, but also just our own personal selfishness and any other number of things that we're still stuck on, right? It's it's a messy business, <laughs> so.
you can follow the pattern of what can I affirm, what can I not affirm. And then we can talk about how to bring the gospel to bear on it here. <laughs> You're allowed to do that if you want. Steph, this is Alan Zaran. Hey, Alan. Um, one one thing that um, I I've been exploring, I've read the the chapters, the more recent chapters in your your book, um, mm -hmm. same like different boat, mm -hmm. and appreciated those very very much. Um, one thing that I've been exploring, you briefly mentioned it, and that is uh, the issue of love in this uh, mm -hmm. context. And reading First Corinthians thirteen from the bookends of chapter 12 and chapter 14, mm. where chapter 12 says that I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, et cetera, et cetera. And in chapter 14, where we all have spiritual gifts yeah. and understanding the love is this, it is not this, it is this, this, mm -hmm. in, in the context of 12 and 14, uh, I think gives a good church perspective on how to deal with chapter 13 of first corinthians yeah that's great alan that's that's a good word thank you and yeah when in my book when i do the revolution versus reformation chapter i took that i took a different perspective on love but that yours is equally valid i used romans 12 right and broke it down to the different kinds of love expressed in the second half of romans 12 and how what that love looks like right when we put it into practice so thank you for that as a another great framework to work with it's good to see you and i like to um you know we use the word agape a-g-a-p-e is the english transliteration and i often like to say what's the gap what mm. gap exists in our yeah. agape yeah that's great a-g-a-p-e <laughs> the gap in agape anybody hear anything that didn't sit right with you you're free to say that <laughs> they're speechless that's not good <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well i'm gonna jump in yeah sure um you, you know i do struggle uh we've had a component of empowerment and um within our ministry uh you we, we do a cross-cultural approach where i find your use of terminology interesting and we walk alongside folks, and they didn't really have an equal starting point. They've been marginalized. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, we go to IP meetings. We go to support plans. Mm -hmm. We help uh, give voice to uh, intellectually disabled people and their families to communicate what they want. Also knowing how the rules work and how the systems work, where yep. they can't just be shut down. Mm -hmm. um, and... and I hear a little pushback from you on, mm -hmm. on doing that. Am I hearing you wrong? You're hearing me wrong. You know, I, okay. I think it's a pro totally appropriate. That's both mercy and justice, right? I mean, you're mercifully entering into a situation that is difficult for that other person because of the disability that's in the family. And you're addressing uh, uh, injustice that happens when they don't have a representative at an IEP meeting, for example, to help to balance out a potential power dynamic so i'm not at, i'm by that so i went to luke 4 i said i do believe in luke 4 jesus is actually absolutely calling us right to uh um to truth right to uh to humility in in understanding that truth about ourselves and others to grace in the way we operate to mercy and how we engage people and to justice right biblical justice is is uh evident throughout the old testament straight into the new right the whole idea of half the time that israel was in trouble in the old testament was was injustice on their part in terms of how the poor and the widows and, and uh were being treated right and so i think that's definitely a kingdom value what i'm saying is that using power and control to achieve justice right in a manipulative and and like uh way within the church right particularly 
right, is sincerely is problematic, right? Uh, and I think, and I do have another presentation I can give you guys on on advocacy, right? Advocating like Jesus does, right? Because because I do think the posture with which we advocate, I think absolutely Jesus just lays out for us and throughout his ministry how to, how he advocates for the poor, right, and the blind and the prisoner and the oppressed, right? And so. Um, so advocacy is definitely part of our role, right, as believers in culture. Um, what we don't want to do is bring secular values or methods of doing that into the body of Christ because we have God-given methods, right, that we've already been given by the example of Jesus and how we conduct ourselves, right, and by, um, by this whole idea of, of, of reformation by the power of the Spirit within the body of Christ. So. Uh, so Stephanie, they're already asking um, to schedule the advocacy session. Okay, so <laughs> we, we will discuss for a future. Okay. Yeah. Any other? Can I do? A, can I do a follow up? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so in the church, yeah. If I have an issue, I should do Matthew eighteen. But if I'm in a local agency, I've got to follow the administrative rules and the state structure to process a situation. And that can look a whole lot like secular empowerment, I think. It can it can look the process and the posture are two different things, right? So yes, you may be in a totally different process than Matthew 18. Absolutely. Right. You're not working between two believers, right? But you but the posture you take, a Christ-like posture of advocacy, right? Versus one of of uh, of operating from an autonomous sense of of human power and control to radically, I would propose radically different things. Yeah. So again, my revolution versus reformation is in the context of the church. That that chapter is written for the church, right? Uh, Christ-like advocacy is its own thing, but it's all about posture. I would believe it, it's all about posture. And if you have not yet read Same Lake, Different Boat, everyone, please, please do. Um, it's, you need to read it. And um, I mean, this, what we talked about today, yeah, you definitely need to read it. Um, and we'll absolutely have Stephanie back for a, a future Future. Maybe we could do one too sometime with just on, not that I'm just over and over again inviting myself like I have nothing else to do and you have nothing <laughs> else to do, but listen to me. But we could do just a whole hour just on revolution versus reformation and walk through some examples in church. Okay, because we've had some pretty tough examples in my church over the years where, where everything in me wanted to go full bore re revolution. <laughs> Right. I'm not saying I don't feel that way, right? but but taking the higher road, right, of uh, just a whole nother thing. <laughs> so again, I apologize for the technology issues, guys. Oh, I know that's yeah. really I mean, disruptive. It literally happened to all of us, so so yeah. know that. Um, so I'll tell you what, I give me like a day to get this video and I might even like cut out the um, the gaps, but to get this video posted. Um, yeah. So I am going to watch it again because this information was so good. And um, so I will post it with any links or uh, the maybe stuff. If yeah. you can email me your slide deck, I'll try to yeah. get that. I got a great article too by Tim Keller on life okay. in the upside down kingdom. Okay, great so we'll read. Post I'll give you guys that too. With it. Mm -hmm. So just so everybody knows, you can always access um, these roundtable videos on the Key Ministry Vimeo channel, the YouTube channel, or if you go to keyministry.org, you can, uh, there's a whole page dedicated to these disability ministry video roundtables. Mm -hmm. So you can access any of the recordings. Um, so um yeah so i really appreciate everybody being here today yeah, thank um, you guys the comments that you know i can see everybody just like thinking through all this um and steph huge huge thank you um we really appreciate you steph is one of the board members of key ministry um so we are very grateful for her dedication to um not just this field but to our ministry too so 
We appreciate you. Um, thank you, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you next time. And I'll call from home next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care, guys. Thank you so much. Bye.